So welcome to the second lecture of Women Tech Makers Berlin Advanced JavaScript course. Um, the first one was um, about design patterns, which was actually a lecture from last year. But uh, we had to do that um, going forward. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we're going to continue with authentication and middleware in Node.js. And then we'll, we're going to talk about making use of multiple APIs, um, connecting multiple data sources in a backend application to make use of um, external sources and to make sure we can incorporate anything that's coming our way from the outside world um, to our application, whether it's accounts, whether it's third-party data, whether it's user data of another application. Um, then we're going to talk about the front end, how we're going to implement um, a user interface application, not dummy templates and pod templates, but a real user interface application um, on top of <coughs> our current app. And then the final lecture will be about databases. We'll go into and make reporting and um, other database constructs available to us. And hopefully that will cover a very much advanced use case. We start with user accounts, creating user accounts, logging people in, signing them in, uh, protecting our API from unauthorized access, um, like people who don't have accounts with us. Um, and we're going to continue. Now, last year we were building applications. Everybody had their own applications, actually. Um, anything that they wanted to build. And you can continue building on top of that. Like, this course is designed so that you complete that application. You started something, it was working um, as if there were only one user in the system. Um, like, we didn't have user accounts and stuff, right? And <coughs> Sorry. And basically what you can do is you can continue building on top of your application the authentication layer, um, external data sources that you want to work with, etc. Or you can build something from scratch. Now I'm going to give you the, uh, the last application that we made use of in the, in the previous lectures. And that's kind of like a boilerplate. It has a certain API. It connects to MongoDB. It you know, creates records, it can, it can read records, etc. That also has um, all the infrastructure stuff built in, so testing, Docker, um, and even, you know, pushing it to the cloud and scaling on multiple machines that's already built in uh, to the boilerplate. <coughs> and if you're new to the course, you can watch the classes from last year. Basically, the links are on the web page. Um, you can directly watch them on YouTube and Basically, you get the same, uh, get to the same level. Again, we cover um, API testing and deploy a, a continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline, and everything basically is built into the the, the code that we're starting with. And we will have homeworks again. The reason for why we did you know one week lectures, one week study groups is that you have enough time to do the homeworks and in the study groups you can work on them. Um, I will try to be um, at the study groups after this as much as possible to help you there as well uh, with your code challenges. So the idea is uh, we take forward this class with real world implementations in your own projects and we build cool stuff together with this thing. And if you follow them, that would be really nice. Not for me, obviously for you. Um, you won't learn unless you implement these things on your own. So I encourage you, um, I will share the recording of this class hopefully tomorrow. Um, so you will have you know, a lot of time to go over the steps and to implement it on your own. Um, and I encourage you to implement the strategies that we'll talk about today in your own projects. You can start anything from scratch as well. If you're out of ideas, we can help. Um, let's make use of Slack. Um, please join our Slack group, Women Take Makers Berlin. <coughs> All the instructors are there. I'm there, 724. Um, anytime you ask a question, we um, make sure we help you and find the right answer. So, again, this thing is designed to help you work. This thing is designed to get you started, get you productive. And um, in order to get the most benefit out of it, you should start right away. Um, not only 
during the class, but afterwards implementing on your own and learning on your own. Um, all right, if you have any questions at any time, if I'm going too fast, just raise your hand, tell me, and I will try in a little bit more detail. There is a variance in the class um, between people's individual experiences. I'll try to make sure um, I cover the most ground as possible, as simple as possible, with explaining the concepts. Um, but feel free to raise your hands to ask questions. There are no silly questions, there are no dumb questions. Um, it's all fine. Everybody has to have a path um, in their software career and we're here to help you. Basically. So feel free if you have any questions at all. We have three co-instructors today. One is Chris. Um, yeah, there. And we have Miri and Umur. So again, you can raise your hands and call them. Um, they will try to help you out with your local problems, like when something is not working out as expected. Um, today, I will write a lot of code and I expect you to follow up um, the implementation that I'm doing. Um, it's good if you can do. It's okay. It's okay if it's too fast. You can just watch it here. Try to learn as much as you can because I will share the recording anyway. So you will have time to repeat it um, afterwards. And I'm looking forward to your applications that you're going to build. Um, this is a real life course that is supposed to teach you real um, application development. Um, so hopefully we will achieve that together. And I have one trick question. Anybody who worked on the observer pattern after Thursday? Two, three, more? Okay. Um, that was the homework from uh, last Thursday. Um, of course, these, you know, these are just up to you. Uh, but you can share your findings in Slack um, with me or you, know, you can make a GitHub repository um, of your achievements so far, of your trials, experiments, and everybody will learn from it. This is again a community, so the goal is we learn from it. It's not like somebody takes some information and experience and hides it, but um, the overall goal is to share it. So, um, I'm thinking about Node.js. Uh, but before we start, does anybody have any questions so far? It could be about anything. Feel free to ask. No? Okay. <coughs> um, did everybody clone the repository? Raise your hands if you did clone it. Okay. Um, did you? You just arrived. <laughs> um, the repository is here. WTMBJSA. Um, you can clone it, you can do whatever you want with it, just get the source code. Uh, we'll be running this. Um, do we need the... Sorry? Do we need the uh, invitation to join this live I guess you need the link of an invitation. You just need to search in the GitHub website. You can search in the GitHub <laughs> so I guess you can help. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Who ran the application and can see something in the browser? Okay. Um, maybe we can start with that. So here's the URL. Um, this is the web page, GitHub dot com slash op dash w slash wtmb jsa I grab the the repository URL <clears throat> I close if you have git that's nice if you don't have git um, come to us in the break and we'll help you out So one way to run it is by typing node um, node source. Oh, of course. Before everything, we have to do an npm install, right? <coughs> so I cloned the repository. I entered the directory. I did an npm install. Um, it takes some time. It will.
Yeah. And then I do node source and it will start listening. Now, this created a that serves some APIs and the, the port is 3000. So if you go to localhost 3000, you see something like this. Um, is it familiar? Yes. Do you remember when we wrote this did I update thing last year? Um, but basically you should be seeing this. It's localhost 3000. Um, I can have a couple of more minutes to make sure more people get this thing running. Um, <coughs> raise your hands if you can't. And again, we have Chris Free, for example. Um, but yeah, there's somebody here. Yeah, yeah, please. There's one URL that is very interesting to us. Um, Localhost 3000 slash person slash all um, gives us the, the records in our system in MongoDB. I have one record, you have none. So let me So you should be seeing this when you go to person slash all, right? That's all right because um, because of the previous lectures, um, you're probably using the same database. So that's that's fine. Um, we can have all the people as an um, as JSON in our system, since we have none, we see an empty array here. Uh, it's localhost slash person. Um, we have a URL called person slash two, for example, that will give you um, a, a user profile page, a user detail page, if there were any such users in our system, any such people in our system. So this is a very simple application. We call it a crowd application lead, um, that creates records called people. All right, we create people um, and we can manage them in our application. Um, this is a very simple Node.js Express application uh, with MongoDB built in. I will walk you over the code a little bit, um, but since it's a, it's a Node.js HTTP web server, let me show you how to create new records. Um, so there's a library called Axios. Raise your hands if you know Axios as a library. That's good, a lot of front-end developers then. Um, so, <coughs> so, yeah. The syntax is this, axios.post slash person. This makes a post request to the backend, which will create a new person record, all right? And we pass in an object as the second parameter, give it a name and an age, all right? And then we log what the backend gives us. When you run it, the backend returns you a new JSON. So that has an age, um, no friends yet, because there is no one else in the system. Um, an ID and a name. So, <coughs> so this is how you create a person. Uh, please follow it. I opened the the console in Chrome. Just type this: axios.post person, um, and it basically creates a person in our system. Whenever So hopefully this will still work. Yeah. Now when I refresh, the the web page is updated. It says, "Hello, Diego. Can you believe this thing is actually live?" Um, and it gives us the the JSON of what we just created. Raise your hands if you still um, can see this. If you did, if you did this, implemented this. That's great. Perfect. Um, again, let's get everybody up to speed. If you want, you can ask for help. Uh, I'm recording this, by the way, so you don't have to record it. 
I have the screen casting. Any questions so far? Okay, what we did was we created a new record in our database, a new person record, okay? And we can see it on the front end. When you go to localhost 3000 slash person, that is the URL, it gives you the JSON for this user, for this person, not a user, this is a person. Anybody? Yeah, please. Um, the URL is here. Okay. Um, now I'm going to continue to look at the code. Uh, raise your hands if you're not familiar with Node.js code or Express code. One, it's okay. Two, um, three, four. Anybody else? So all the others are kind of familiar with Node.js. That's great. Um, do you have any familiarity with JavaScript? All right. Um, then I hope it will be. It won't be too um, too convoluted for you. But the first thing that we note is we're, we're making use of the Express library. If you want, you can read more about it, how to create new routes and um, parameters and URL parameters and query parameters and everything. Uh, we covered that uh, in the previous lectures. We also have videos of it. So if you want, you can also watch the videos. Um, here is, <coughs> sorry. Um, we say that for every request that comes to slash person and onwards, so slash person slash all slash person slash one or whatever, uses something called a person router, okay? Um, we define it in here in roots slash um, person.js and it's very simple. You have a router instance and you define get requests and you give it the URLs. Now, this uses person as a prefix. So everything you see here has a person before them. So it's the, the first one is person slash, the second one is person slash all, the third one is person all JSON. Um, if we go back to the example, this is person all gives you a nicely rendered web page and person all JSON gives you the array in JSON format. <coughs> if you are wondering how we created our person instance, this is the root handler for that. So whenever there's a post request to the slash root, which means to slash person, um, call person service, which is a backend model that we built before. Um, it's a MongoDB model, Mongoose model, let's say. It's a, we're using a library called Mongoose. So we say person service dot add, and we pass in the body that's coming through from the request. So if you remember, we were passing name and age as parameters uh, to axios.post, and they are here in rec. Passing it to the person service to add it to the database. It's very simple. Um, we make use of async and await keywords here, so we don't have to deal with callbacks and stuff. So this is this looks a little bit neater um, in JavaScript. Anybody who is not familiar with async and await, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, um, it's. It's a better alternative for promises or for callbacks. Uh, we had a whole lecture dedicated to async programming. And again, it's on YouTube. You can watch it if you like. Uh, but we go over several asynchronous programming mechanisms. We start with callbacks. We simplify it with promises. And then we simplify it with async await. Um, 
if you didn't use async await, this would be something like error person. So this would be a callback. This is the new ES6 syntax of creating, this is called the arrow function, um, if you don't know it. Um, but, you know, you would have this rest send here and <coughs> this would still work. But, um, you know, when you chain many of these calls, you have a pyramid of um, callbacks. We call it the callback hell. And then we went to do this with promises. We removed this error from here, said this dot add returns a promise. So we can use then in that. And we said, okay, this is a promise. Now you can chain them uh, one after the other. It's a little bit easier, but this is still convoluted. Um, and the newest JavaScript standard has something called, again, async and await keywords. In the background, it converts your code to promises. So you can await any promise. If you are working with third party use of promises, you can use async and await with them. You can await the resolution of a promise and you will get the result automatically. Um, one question could be, how can you catch errors here? Um, because previously in the callback, the first parameter was the error. Um, with the promise, we had dot then or dot catch um, to catch for the errors. This is very simple. We just use the regular old try catch box. <laughs> So, you know, you can catch the error and log it to the console um, as if you're writing synchronous code. So this is a little bit simpler um, to read because there is no indentation and there's no, you know, function calling like then or error or catch or whatever. So this is a little bit easier. Yeah, please. But, but you cannot do uh, multiple... Uh... <coughs> exactly. This is not a blocking call. Uh, it will not stall your application, which means your application is able to serve other clients and other requests, but it will block your current request. So until you fetch the record from the database, like the result of this add call, the next line will not be executed. So uh, the new JavaScript engine basically waits between line 33 and 34 here. It just doesn't move on um, until we have the result of this uh, person service that add. So which means you cannot do stuff in parallel. You cannot do multiple calls to the database or multiple calls to, the, um, to an external service in parallel. This is not a problem for this because we only have one single record. Um, it's also another problem if you do let's say um, sequential reads, like if you have to read one after the other one, you can, uh, it's only a problem if you wanna do multiple reads at the same time. And this will, we will face with this problem um, next week or in two weeks when we bridge multiple APIs uh, because we will want to fetch multiple records in parallel uh, and not wait for one another. Uh, and we'll talk more about that later. <coughs> but this is how we create a new user, a new um, person. And how we delete it is also the same. You do router.delete, give it an ID. Um, see, it has a colon here, which means this is a parameter. So we can read it through rec.params.id. Um, so we get pieces of the URL dynamically in our code and we can delete those records. So we have person service dot delete. Um, we don't return anything other than an okay statement um, and implement deletion. So let's try to delete Tiago, for example. Go to a page like this, where it displays the, the nice layout because it's what gives you Axios. So, Tiago's ID is three, so I'm gonna do axios.delete slash person slash three. 
and you will see that gives me okay it deleted it and when I refresh person slash all I'll see that there's no one so I successfully deleted Tiago Any questions so far? How, how is it uh, that we have now access to the console available? Um, it's in the layout. I basically include Axios.js um, from, from a CDN. Oh, you call it? You call it. You, yeah. You load it uh, yeah. 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 <coughs> um, I can actually show it to you. It's here in layout.pug. So right after the title, we have a script to include it. That's why it's not available in the JSON versions because we don't have a layout. It's raw JSON. Um, are you all with me? Do you feel comfortable so far? It's okay to say no. And again, we have a lot of people here to help you. Then I'm moving on with the topic of this class, right? Middleware. Now, raise your hands and give me. Uh, for example, authentication was. Or a logging middleware. Logging middleware, yeah. Authentication. Authentication, yes. Um, any other examples of a middleware? Uh, not an example, more of a definition. So it's, yeah. it's a piece of code that runs on every request that does a specific thing. Yeah. Okay. It's a piece of code that runs on every request that does a specific thing. Um, any other definition of a middleware? Don't be shy, please. Yeah. So let's say Facebook yeah. is a platform, but first we need to log in, and the login is kind of middleware. Yeah. And otherwise, like uh, getting the advertisements, all the analytics things, and those are also different middleware, but then mm -hmm. So that's what I would call middleware. Okay. Um, so, piece of software. No, one piece of software. Yeah, a certain piece of software. Okay. Um, I guess we could define it like this. It's something, um, the, the key word is the middle, right? It's something in the way um, and you have a target that you want to achieve and this thing is basically blocking you or, you know, it's in the way. You can work around it, you can move around it, um, but it's there in the way, in the middle of um, your path to your target. Whatever your target is, it could be fetching something, it could be, you know, video. Um, think of it like the advertisements on YouTube. When you want to watch something on YouTube, um, there's a, we call it pre-roll video, you know, for five seconds. Um, you can skip it or you can not skip it. Guys, you're too loud. Um, so you can skip it or not skip it. That's kind of a middleware that um, basically modifies or access to the resource. It tells, you know, you have to wait at least five seconds to skip this. And there is no way around it until, of course, maybe you can refresh and hope that the, the advertisement will go away, the video will go away. Um, that's the definition of, of a middleware. And why do we use middleware? So, of course, the, the topic of today is to use it for authentication, to check if a user is logged in to the system, if they have an account, if they have a profile with us, um, because we don't want to records, right? We don't want anybody to create records. It would be really silly if you could delete your friend's Facebook posts, for example. There has to be an authentication mechanism to check that you are the person who created that record, for example, um, in order for you to be able to delete that. Or it could be a step further. Maybe it wouldn't allow you to delete stuff um, and like after 10 minutes um, of posting it. So you can delete it within the 10 minutes of posting it, but after that you lose that ability. That would still be a middleware. But then there are other examples, as you suggested. Uh, for example, for logging. 
we may want to log all the requests that come to our server uh, just for I don't know for um, to comply with the law for example uh, some countries expect you to log everything um, every request and their IP addresses and you know which sources um, just for um, you know national yeah national security you have to keep them for five years or something um, your server logs so this would be a logging middleware or you could say you know I want an error middleware so if there's an error in the system I want to um, specifically log them to, to somewhere else or um, you could inject some stuff as um, in the requests you could inject a certain parameter like the the location of the user for example based on the IP address you can get the location the country of the user or the language of the user okay uh, from the browser if you want to display your web page in multiple languages um, and if you want to let the user select that language um, you can inject it through middleware again um, so the target resource is the web page and you want to change so you build a middleware and that middleware goes right in the middle between the user user's initial request and the end result and the web page and injects the language um, to the web page so that you know um, the user sees it in their own language does it kind of make sense why we need uh, middleware you can say yes or no yes okay please so would be the word inject or change the words? it could be both you could be injecting stuff or you could be changing stuff um, you can also have multiple middleware so you can have you know four different middleware running one after the other until the end result and there um, for example the middleware at the end could change the result of the middleware uh, at, at the front at um, the first middleware or the initial, re initial request so you can modify the request or you can inject new parameters to it um, and the actual root handler that does the job may or may not do stuff so for example here we have the person route right this is how we create a person in our database. Um, we will now implement some middleware to mess with this record. Um, and you, you will have a, a better understanding and better examples of how you can change the incoming request and why it's good and you know, how it's malicious and how it's a nightmare for your colleagues uh, because they don't know which middleware are running. Um, any questions? Does it make sense to do data validation in middleware? <coughs> definitely. Okay. You can definitely do it. Um, it makes more sense to do it than in route handlers. This thing so should be only for business logic. Okay, so it shouldn't care about data. It's... Yeah, you could say that. Or you could do it in the model, like um, the add function could also do its own validation. Um, it depends on your application architecture, but data validation is a nice um, implementation or a use case of middleware. Any other questions? But in the front end, we would do this. We wouldn't do data validation in the front end. Um, you can do that if you like. You know, if you don't want to hit the the server to get the validation results, you can definitely implement it in the front end uh, for quicker, you know, user experience for a better user experience. And the idea is, since you, if like if you're running Node.js on the back end, you can have an abstracted data validation logic, so you can reuse the same code on the front end, the same modules on the front end, without rewriting validation logic. Because if you change something, you would have to update it in both places, both in, both in the back end and in the front end. That's kind of not nice. It could be better same validation logic everywhere um, by just including it. So that's also a, a commonly used technique. Any questions? Any other questions? All right, then I'm going to start writing code and I expect you to follow up. Or um, if you like, we can also take a break. Um, no? All right, let's first write the first example and then take a break. Um, if you have questions, we'll answer them in the break. All right. <coughs> so, as I already told you, I want to mess with creating a user. All right, let's first go back and create a user here. Right now, I don't have anybody. 
um, you know I have this Axiostat post Tiago age 28 all right I refresh it I have the users there um, now I want to change this in a way that fit the age think that <laughs> this is used in heaven where everybody is 33 years old so um, whenever creating a new user whenever I create a new user I want to set the age to 33 all the time without changing any logic in my root handler so how can I do that I can make use of a middleware and let's first make a function for that um, fix age for example this function will get the same parameters as a root handler so it's request response and something called next and next is the important word here next is actually what gives you the ability to implement middleware and the ability to chain middleware because once you're done you call next so that um, the next piece of code in the system is able to run um, on the request so request response and next okay this is a function and <coughs> rec.body.age equals 33 so I directly mess with the incoming parameters incoming body and manipulate it and fix it to a certain age and then I call next because I'm done I modified the um, the record the incoming record that I want to create and I'm done and I call next so that whatever comes after this will run on its own. Um, now I need a way to make this work for the post route handler, right? And the way I do that is just by typing fix age the middle. Why? Because it's a middleware. It's called a middleware. So yeah, it's basically as simple as this. So previously I had this route handler like this on line 37 uh, it was just post slash and then async whatever uh, the the route handler and I oh sorry and I just added the middleware in between because I want to modify the incoming request and then I want this um, handler to work okay yeah so when you would like to have a second one is it just also added this parameter here? a second a second one yeah. Okay. Like this. You could have multiple of them. Um like after yeah. this function? When we read them, you mean? Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, like for example here, this is the get handler. Um and that renders a full view, like a full HTML, and the second one renders the JSON response. Um, of course, you can basically um, call the, the same, not the same function, because it's expecting a request body, but you could call a similar function here. Or you can abstract the middleware in such a way that it's callable from within the route handler or um, as a middleware. Um, But let me talk about this next here. What do you think this next does? Currently, we don't make use of it. But it's there available as a, as a parameter, please. No, I just want to say it moves on to the next function. Sorry? No, no. Yeah, please. Yeah, it moves on to the next function. Exactly. Uh, it moves on to the next function, but currently there is no next function. So how could we make use of this? Yeah, but I want to make use of it. I want to use it. Currently, there is no next function. How can I implement the next function um, within this piece of code so that I, I can make use of it? Um, like this. 
maybe. Does it make sense? I created a new function as a parameter after the root handler. So this was the root handler here that was doing all the job and it wasn't calling next because there was no next. But middleware that we can chain however many times we want. So we could write fix age or any other middleware in between and this would still work. Um, I want to underline something. Your route handlers are not different than middleware. They're also middleware. It's just that they're coming in as, as a last parameter. So, yeah. Could you, instead of putting a new request routes next type of function, just put fix age at the end, and then it just does that next? Here? Yeah. Um, yes, but this would fail. Well, because it's using the request, right? Um, no, we have the request here. The problem is this thing how we interact with the outside world, how we send the result to the outside world. Rest.send person is what sends the JSON to the outside world. Um, if you remove this, it will be okay, better, but still now the user wouldn't get any response. You need to put it here. If you do this, this also works. Now, I commented out the next in the uh, middleware, and I'm directly sending the response in the middleware. Okay? This thing would also work. So, of course, I don't have fixed age here. Yeah. yeah. So, everything is actually a middleware. Your route handlers are also middleware. It only depends on where you use them. If you use them in the middle, they become in a middleware. Um, and if, of course, if you use next, um, if you don't, if you use them at the end, then they become route handlers, uh, but then you have to also send the response to the client, right? They should get, a, get the JSON response somewhere. So let's go back and try the, the version that we first created. <coughs> okay, so we have the, um, and we're posting, we're creating a new user, we expect the age to equal to 33 all the time. Um, let's go back. Yeah, we still have the user. We have a single user. Let me create a new one named Armon. Well, 44, whatever. I'm not 44 years old. Um, and I create it and look at the response that you get. You get 33. When I refresh the page, um, you see that I'm recorded as 33 because the middleware worked and the, um, the response, um, the request is changed. Now, can you see why this is painful for um, some developers? Usually you don't see this. Usually this is in another uh, file, in another module that's somewhere else in the project among a hundred others. You just see that there is a middleware um, and some colleagues tell you that you have to use it because it's the way other people do it. Or like you see other route handlers, they have used this middleware, so you feel like you have to also use it. Um, and then you have you know, some sort of weird behavior in your code that you don't know. Um, well, this means you have to be very careful with how you write the middleware. Um, this thing is not allowed. You don't change the incoming parameters um, you don't mess with the body, you don't mess with the parameters like rec.params um, because it will have adverse effects on other people who actually write the business logic to work with that. Um, that's why injection is a better idea, which means you can inject stuff like rec. I don't know, version equals three, rec. language equals de, for example. You can inject stuff like this and you can read that stuff here. You can do console log, um, let's say, version, rec.version, all right? Um, you can pass stuff to the later stages by injecting them in your requests or in your responses. Yeah. And you save it, 
and create a new record. You see the version is logged onto the screen. We passed this from our middleware. We injected a parameter to the request, right? Um, here's a real use case for why we use this thing. Um, the, the language that comes from the browser is weird. It's sometimes like this, DE underscore DE in capital letters. Um, sometimes it's just DE, sometimes it's DE, okay? And of course, this is not easy to work with uh, when you have multiple versions of the languages. Um, or we even have this AT underscore DE from Austria. Um, they still speak German. And as far as we care, we just care about the language, not where they come from. Um, so we use, for example, a middleware to format the locale and to find the language. So um, if it includes anywhere in capital DE, we make sure it passes as underscore DE. And if not, uh, we just use EN. So we use the default version, for example. Um, so it's, it's a very good use of middleware to um, look at the input data, to format it a little bit, and to present to the next handlers something that's more concrete that they can work with. Um, but yeah, this is mostly how we use middleware. Now, do you want to give a break? I can continue until the morning. I don't have any problems with speaking. Um, if you want a break, raise your hand. Two, three. The other one, I continue. That's perfect. Um, all right. Um, yeah, you can take a break of 10 minutes. The other people who want to stay here, we can continue. I promise we won't lose any ground. Um, if you want to leave and you know take a break, that's fine. But looks like most of the people want to continue, so I'm just going to continue <laughs> um, with stuff that you can catch on later. So any other questions so far? No questions? It's all clear? Ah, uh, okay. Um, so you need help. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions about middleware? Or why we use it? Um, in the last year, I'm sure we had the knowledge to do something like this already, but we didn't do it in this way. It's just that I can't exactly remember what way we would have used before getting introduced to this topic. What are the other options? Options. Instead of using middleware, what are the other options to kind of there are none. That's all we have. Yeah. But I feel like I would have known how to change the data to something else already before. Maybe like a new model. But then you have to call it inside the handler. Yeah. Like, like this, for example. So of course we could do that, create a new function and call it. Um, <coughs> but this is another way of doing it. And actually the next step is in showing why this is more powerful than you currently think. Um, yeah. Um, currently nothing happens because we're just logging it. But you could do stuff like this if that version is smaller than three um, return rest that send 401 which is the HTTP code for not authorized do it here uh, but this is the place where we inject it so it wouldn't make much sense because we are injecting it at that point in time um, like if we would do it here, we wouldn't, let's, let's do it like this. So we have this fixed age and then check age, okay? Check age would do stuff like that. And if
then this works. Does it make sense? Is it clear? No worries. So this is how it's implemented. It, oh, sorry. It calls person model dot create, and person model is a mongoose model. If you are familiar with the database library um, built for MongoDB, so it's it's called an ODM, much like an ORM, object relational mapping. Um, what it gives you is um, is a schema like this. So you have the name, you have the age, and you have some friends who are also persons. Um, and this gives you all the methods required to create records, read records, find records, um, update them, delete them, whatever. And um, the way we implement the service is basically we um, proxy, let's say, the incoming calls to the model. So if you want to delete it, we call person model dot remove. If you want to add something, we call person model dot create. Um, and if you want to get all the users, all the people in the application, we first find them and then we do something called population, this inner join. Um, so it, because every people can have friends, right? Every person can have friends. Um, and the way they are implemented is we keep the IDs of the friends and not the friends themselves in the database. Um, but as a JSON, we want the whole details like the friends as well. So what this does is it gets a person record, the one that you're finding, and populates the, his friends, basically. Um, now, we we're talking about how dangerous these guys are, uh, because they mess with the request, um, and it's hard to know what are running beforehand. Um, let me show you another version of this thing. So, okay. We defined the, the middleware, right? And this was the middleware. Now, if you go back to focus on this line, app.use person person, if you remember, this meant for every URL, starting from person, use this router, right? Now, what you can do is you can inject middleware in every part of the project, in every path, um, and it's actually encouraged to do so for, for several reasons. For example, what we can do is we can write um, app.get, okay? slash asterisk and have another function here console log rec .url, and then call next what does this do raise your hands and tell me what this does someone else someone else you're talking too much I want I want people who don't speak. Yeah. Print in the console, the URL, the 
Yeah, the URL that we're currently in. Which URLs? But like all of them. Okay, um, that's actually true. So let's try. We built this app.get slash asterisk um, and then a middleware again. So we go back to the to the application. I refresh something and I see the URL. Here. Okay, um, I go to person slash all slash JSON gives me the JSON representation of all the records that I have. I have Miri, Arman, and, and Tiago. And it gave me the URL here, person, all JSON. So by adding something somewhere else, I actually could affect the operation of the, of the application. Now, let's be evil. Let's move this fixed age from here and I also removed it from the post request. Okay. So what will happen now when I create a new record? Will the age change? No, it will be the same, right? Um, I will get whatever I give. Let's first try that. I go to personal <coughs> and I create a new record called Umer, and you already see that um, he got his correct age. All right. Now, what am I gonna do next? Hmm? Apply the middleware to the Yeah. Um, what we can do here is we can we can say app dot post okay slash person oh. and just copy here yeah so Whenever there's a post request in in the person route, I change the age to 33 and then call next. Okay. Let's see if this will work. Um, the server updated. Let's change the age to something else. Let's create Chris. Is that how I write your name? Yeah. How old are you? Perfect. 28. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. You see, he is 48. And when you refresh it, you get the record as 48. Now, did I update the person route at all? No. This thing doesn't know what happened. But I was able to inject. A middleware in a <coughs> sorry in a different part of the stack in a different part of the application and it still ran this is really um, really harsh yeah so in this function we call uh, the second time next yeah but how does the function know where the next is going to be if we already use it I guess the next is calling the function which is in the person class. Person route, yeah, here. So when we create a, <coughs> sorry, when we create a, a router like this, uh, we are registering route. This call here, app.post, is registering a route handler for posting to slash person. Um, doing the same thing. Here, the person router. You know, router that post means, and we had the the prefix of person here. Um, whenever there's a post request to person slash, register this handler. Now this comes as the second handler. The first handler is this one. 
And how does it work? Because we use this line next, like f.use person, and we give it the router as the second one. That's why this runs first. I could take it here and put it here, okay? Which would mean the handler in the person router is the first one, like this one is the first handler right now. And the second handler is my middleware. This thing won't work because we are already ending, the, already getting the per, uh, creating the person, getting it, and sending it back to the browser. There is no next here. If we had a next here, then that thing would work. Um, Sorry. Yeah. I have a question. Um, the next function doesn't exist. You said we haven't written the next function, have we? So currently there is a next function for this thing. Other. Oh, because we registered the other handler um, as the second handler. Like since the code executes line by line, it first executes this line, which calls this whole file. And we register this as the first handler. And then we register this as the second handler. Because this came afterwards. Which made, okay, then um, if you call next in the previous one, it will come here. So this thing here, you can call it here. <coughs> which means there is no next here anymore. If you call this, there is, I mean, of course, the the code won't crash uh, just because you're calling next, uh, but there are no handlers uh, for that. So it doesn't make sense to call next here right now. Um, so the order is very important. The order of the middleware, where you define the middleware, is actually pretty important. And it also... Um, It also means that you can tap into requests or other middleware. So you may come um, across a project that already has you know, five middleware listed and you want to get in between them, you can do so by you know, um, placing your um, middleware call appropriately. And as you see, there is another method called use. It's pretty much the same thing as, as post or get or um, delete. Basically, um, when we make use of use function, we say whatever comes afterwards is a again a middleware. That is, um, that doesn't care whether it's a get request, whether it's a post request or a delete request. Like it runs for everything. For every request that comes to person, again, we redirect to the person router. We could use a like a similar middleware here. We could use app.use slash asterisk. Then this would work for whether it's a delete request, whether it's a uh, post request or a get request. So this is how you build middleware. And this is why it's very tricky, very dangerous. And this is why you should be very careful about it because um, these are kept at a separate place um, in the project than your route handlers. So the person who is dealing with the business logic here, they don't know, they may not know which middleware exists in the system. Okay, and it's very tricky for them when debugging, when they do <clears throat> debug some stuff. Like they put a breakpoint here, they expect the execution to come here, but it doesn't. And they're like, what else is there? And they have to fish for the middleware. That's why project structure is also very important. Um, you have to be very clear where, where you put the middleware, where you um, inject some stuff. That's why most of the time we use app.js for it, uh, which is the entry point of your application, uh, where you first require and create the express app, um, so that it's front and center. <coughs> And there are a lot of projects which this doesn't make sense because the project is huge. Like you have 400 root handlers, um, 20 modules, um, and you have different middleware for different modules. So make sure that when people you know, do a search or find a place, 
when they write middleware, um, they find it. So currently it's hidden. When I write middleware, I get no results. Okay, this is tricky. Um, another alternative could be looking for next, where like to spot middleware. And this is horrible. This is horrible for our colleagues. Remember, this is a human problem. Software architecture is a human problem. Um, you don't want to put your friends in the situation where they type next and then see where the middleware are. So use this sparingly. So when we're using middleware for our project, which is not that big, where should we put it? What would you recommend? <coughs> I recommend um, a new folder called middleware. So it's front and center. Um, 100, like fixed age. Okay. And just export a module there doing the same thing. I mean, rec.body.age equals 33 and then next. Then what you do is um, you can require this whenever you want, wherever you want. Um, you could require this in app.js. Um, middleware slash fix age and you can make use of it here yeah or here sorry here okay yeah um, yeah, so have all your middleware in the middleware folder, middleware okay. folder, For and the whole yeah, okay. um, it depends on the architecture. Like, um, it's currently, for example, we have like twenty different modules in our code base, and every one of them has their own middleware because we don't share middlewares. Um, but it depends on the on the project. And now this is a lot easier because when you Search for middleware. You can see it. Please, where it's used, where it's required, and stuff. <coughs> Any other questions? I want to move on to authentication. Creating an application and signing in and, and user user. Account. No questions at all. Please. One general question. Yes. Yeah. Um, you never did any comments in your code. So, I mean, of course, because it's class right now, but do you comment your middleware functions somehow? Because in Java, it's quite common. And do you do commentary to create some kind of Java doc? Is, it, is there something in JavaScript for what you? Um, yes, there is something called JS doc, which is very much like JDoc. Um, you write annotations, and it gives you a full blown documentation. Um, we sometimes make use of it. I encourage using it. Uh, but I don't write documentation at all um, as like this is example code and stuff but of course in production um, we try to do it there is a compiler in JavaScript called Google Closure Compiler um, which enforces strict typing and you have to use annotations there to indicate types for the parameters and everything okay. which means you can instantly create documentation out of it because it also expects you to write the names of the parameters and explanation of the parameters, um, which is a little bit more strict, but it's also better to use in an enterprise setting, for example. <coughs> it's like using TypeScript, but better because you don't need a special uh, compiler. It's still JavaScript, but it has annotations with comments. Any other questions? No. OK. Yeah, please. The middleware, yeah. So it's just like this. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Now the next question is: um, We want to restrict access to our application. Everybody to create new people. They can display it. Okay, um, they can see the list of people, but they shouldn't be able to create new people. 
um, because they're not our users or they're not admins, for example. And um, therefore, they shouldn't be able to delete it and update it, whatever. And I want to build this using middleware, this authentication layer, which means um, I have to have some kind of a concept of an account, right? A user account. I have to have users in my system. Like Facebook has 800 million users, like 3 billion users, I don't know, um, that can log into Facebook and create posts, right? Twitter has a billion user and whatever. Um, the idea is currently, how many users do we have in our system? No. None. Yeah, we don't have any users, which means um, it's public. But of course, this is not a real application, but we want to make it more real. This is what this course is about. So we'll implement user accounts. Uh, we'll implement login through multiple mechanisms um, as long as we have time. Um, I chose Twitter and a local login through username and password. Um, I will demo, I will try to demo both. Who has Twitter accounts here? Twitter accounts? Okay. Raise your hands if you don't have a Twitter account. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Um, so I wanted to do this example with Facebook, but um, it requires HTTPS, it requires SSL certificates. Even when you're running locally on your computer, it will be very hard to set up for you um, to create an SSL certificate in this web server. Um, so I skipped that part. Um, if you don't have a Twitter account, don't worry. Um, that will be a homework for you. You, can, you don't have to create it as we will make use of the strategy pattern um, so you can create um, other login systems. Basically, if you have a GitHub, for example, if you have a GitHub account, you can implement a GitHub strategy and make use of that GitHub account to log into our system. So um, it will be easy for you. All right, uh, I first start with a very dummy implementation, just like with the, the version that you saw. I wanna restrict access <coughs> to, to create um, certain posts, uh, certain persons, okay. So this is the, the root handler. I want everything to work, I just want this um, to be not available to the general public uh, because we currently don't have any user accounts. So how do I do that? Guide me. I want to restrict access to this route. Yeah. Can you add your Yeah, like this. If um, this could be a pseudocode, so if logged in do this or if not logged in return something like that yeah but what if then I wanted to do the same thing for delete do I repeat that thing that line that's not very scalable right we were talking about design patterns and not repeating yourself last week um, yeah we make uh, some sort of blocking required mixing uh, yeah everywhere. yeah <coughs> Yeah, I mean, of course, right? <laughs> the, the topic is middleware in this class. So, <laughs> um, I go to the middleware folder and let's say ensure login.js. Okay. Currently, we don't have any login, so I have access for creating any records at all. Um, this is a new module. Um, just a new uh, function. It's a very simple function. What do I type here? What does this function do? Again, the requirement is I block access without any conditions at all because I don't have user accounts right now. Return like 403. Huh? Return 403. I mean, return 403, 401. Could be. How do you return stuff to the user? What? Yeah. Press that send. 401. Um, currently, we don't have it. So the, the current requirement is we block access. Whenever somebody makes use of this middleware, we completely block access. Um, so where is where does next come into play? 
Hmm? Sorry? Yeah. So should I call it? No. I leave out next because I want this to be the last um, in the pipeline of in the chain of middleware. So, okay. I save this. Go back to the route handler. <coughs> now what do I do here? I first need to require it, right? Middleware ensure login, for example. Okay, then I edit here ensure login. All right. So I secured this API so that you cannot do anything. You cannot create any record. Let's see. Um, okay, I tried to create a new user, a new person, sorry, and I got 401. It didn't allow me to do so. And if I refresh it, this was the list of people that I created before. If I refresh it, <coughs> you will see there are no new records. So I was blocked access. Can I delete a user now? Yeah. Yeah. So let's try to delete Chris because he's not here. <laughs> so slash eight. Okay. Yeah, it says okay, and I refresh, he's gone. So I was able to delete a person, um, but I'm not able to create a new person, right? Um, so this is very interesting. I, which means like in order to make sure people can't delete stuff, I have to edit here as well. Now I go back to the browser. If I try to delete Ömür, I'm not able to do that because he's here. Um, and if I refresh it, he's still here. Um, this brings me to my next point. You have to be very careful when you implement middleware. Um, you may have a module that has standards. You may want to have middleware to affect some of them but not all of them. So this is very tricky. Um, you have to make sure you put them in the right root handlers, which means we have to make sure you don't forget them. Most of the time you'll see there are, you know, a hundred root handlers in a file. It will be a mess and you'll always miss some important APIs that you have to secure. Um, like a bank that I don't want to name when they missed authentication information for um, money transactions. So basically, if you knew the IBAN number, you could withdraw any amount of money um, because it was just a post request. There were no authentication for it. Sorry, what was the question? The question is like, if you put um, the, the ID in your login. Yeah. Just wait. So I can create the same uh, file, so it's your login. Mm -hmm. And now delete is also just uh, granted to your login? Yeah. Okay. Delete is also making use of ensure login. Um, <coughs> please. Do you have, like, for instance, 15 router bots or router delete? Can you can make them globally using this one, or do you have to add them manually? <coughs> so there are ways to do that and I'm gonna talk one of them talk about one of them um, so I changed the the requirement okay I say people can create people persons or lead persons uh, but I don't want to want them to access JSON um, roots so the roots that have JSON at the end so there is a pattern that you see here you know you can get person slash all slash JSON or you can get person 
slash ID slash JSON, right? And I want to protect currently if I save this and if I go to the browser, um, person slash all slash JSON gives you the, the JSON representation. And um, I want to ensure login for the JSON route. What I do is I say router dot get slash asterisk slash JSON and then I say ensure login. This protects all the routes that have JSON at the end. Does it make sense? I use the wildcard. And this also accepts regular expressions, so you could use, make use of regular expressions of anything, of any kind, uh, here. Uh, but it also accepts simple wildcards like this. So this protects all JSON at the end. Again, I didn't have to change my actual root handlers. They are unaware of this protection. This is like an addition on top of middleware. Most of the time, when you're implementing middleware, you don't change the original source code that includes the business logic of deleting of um, creating records. Um, the idea is this comes, you know, way after in terms of development time, um, you know, two months after, three months after, whatever. You want to secure some stuff or change some the behavior of some URLs. That's why it's called middleware. You do it um, in a non-invasive mode. So like this, uh, just add a, a separate line. And now if I do person slash all slash JSON, I get unauthorized. Um, I cannot get the JSON version of the people, but I can still get the HTML version because this is slash person slash all. It doesn't end in JSON, the URL. Um, you go to the JSON version, you cannot see them. When you fetch the detailed page of <coughs> Miri, for example, you can do that. You see the HTML version because that the URL is um, localhost 3000 slash person slash six. When you um, type JSON at the end, you see you are unauthorized. You cannot operate here because, yeah, because I blocked access. So this is one way of doing it. And there are several other ways of um, making sure, you know, you can, you could say this works only on post requests. Um, you could look at the incoming request to see if it has certain parameters in the body or stuff and you could, you know, selectively block access to some resources. Um, for example, you could do, just follow this, but um, you could do stuff like if rec params greater than 10 um, return rest.send401. So if you're looking for users with ID of more than 10, you cannot get them. You could do stuff like this. Or um, after this we'll have user accounts, so you'll have access to the users here. You could, do, you, you could look at the user profile to see, for example, if they have a certain membership or if they have um, if their age is above 18, for example, to show some um, content to them. So there are many different ways of using uh, middleware. And now we're going to move on to something um, with, with the application. <coughs> um, the first thing I want to do is a local setup. Um, I will make use of some libraries. So I want you to go to the the terminal and type npm install passport passport dash local and passport dash local dash mongoose I hope it's oh, readable oh. so here npm install passport, passport local, passport local, mongoose. 
this will take some time, but it <coughs> the necessary packages. Yeah. How did you find all the drivers? Google them. No, like the process of it was you think that you're going to create an authorization system. Yeah. And you need some kind of library that you are trying to find. Yeah. And then you say, okay, let's search for this. Yeah. The idea is um, Node.js has the biggest package manager across all languages. So it's 99% of the time other people wrote the code for you. So you don't have to write it yourself. That's why every time you want to implement something, you first start with a search. You say, okay, like I want to have local user accounts here. I'm using MongoDB and I'm using Mongoose specifically. Is there something for this? So you search, you know, Mongoose user accounts, uh, express and passport. So I knew that there was some library called passport that supports multiple strategies for login. Um, but I didn't know it had a specific library for mongoose, for example, I looked specifically for passport MongoDB. And one of the first links was this passport local mongoose, which is infinitely easy to, to make use of. Um, because implementing secure password handling, uh, registration, etc., is really hard, and you don't have to deal with, you know, encryption. How do you keep them in the database in an encrypted state, etc.? Um, so most of the stuff basically starts with looking for an existing library that already does what you want. Make sense? Um, so the next. Dependency is something called express um, dash session npm install, of course. <coughs> Who can tell me what sessions are? Someone else? Mm -mm, someone else? You you all explained a lot today. Um, again, um, hello. Anybody in the back? Yeah. Yeah. And Yeah. <clears throat> Perfect. So when you log into a web page, you create a session which stores your user information, like your user ID, for example, um, and gives you a cookie in your browser. So all the web pages that make use of cookies make use of cookies for this reason. They track you basically, or you have an account with them. And if you delete your cookies on Facebook, you're logged out. Um, there's no other way for Facebook to log, um, know that uh, you're logged into their web page. Of course, there are, but let's say they're not. Um, and the idea is when you log in, you create a session. You have to store it somewhere. It could be the cookie. It could be um, in the memory of the backend application. It could be in a database. Most of the time, people use Redis, for example, uh, or Memcache to store user sessions because they are very fast. Uh, in storing, you know, billions of small objects. Um, and the idea is we generate something called a session ID. So every session is unique and we give that session ID back to the user. Now, when that user makes use of that session ID, whenever they come to us with that session ID, we know who they are. We just trust that the session ID is unique. We trust that the user can keep it as a secret. Um, that's why this phishing attacks they try to steal your cookies, they try to steal your session IDs because there is no other uh, application or token or password, whatever, once you're logged into a web page. There is just a session ID. If you lose the session ID, then everybody can imitate you and they can, you know, the web page wouldn't know. So keeping the session IDs secure is very important. Um, it's already done by the browsers, so we don't have to care about that, but we have to care about the session. Uh, we have to keep the session somewhere. We have to decode the session from the browser, from the incoming request. Because with every request that you make to a web page, you send that session information, you send that cookie information. Uh, whenever you make any request to Facebook, you send your Facebook session ID to Facebook. That's the only way for them to identify that you are you, basically. So <coughs> Express Session is a library 
um, that enables sessions for your backend applications so that people can create and keep sessions. Passport um, is basically a library that gives you authentication. Um, it uses the strategy pattern as we see how they're useful. I don't have to repeat what a strategy pattern is because hopefully you already know um, how it works. But Passport is by itself is a very small library. It has um, some functions to authenticate you, to log you in to the web page. Um, and then it makes use of 500 different strategies from GitHub to Google Plus to custom strategies to local to Mongoose to Twitter to Facebook, anything that you can imagine. Anything that gives you ability to log in, Passport has a strategy for that. Which means with very small changes, by including little pieces of code in your backend application, you can incorporate multiple login. So it's very simple to do Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus login, plus email and password login in your application. And that's um, what we're going to see today. <coughs> OK. So anybody who could not install those dependencies? All right. So um, let's make use of this. The, the libraries that we um, just created. The first thing is the like passport. I'm going to require that. Comes passport, require passport. Um, I also installed the local mongoose setup, so it's called local strategy. Um, yeah, they already exist. Um, what is this thing? Um, passport. Local. Um, so the local strategy database and local <coughs> um, local mongoose is a, an adapter, we call it an adapter pattern, is an adapter for the local strategy uh, to make sure it can work with a MongoDB. Because local strategy can work with any database. It doesn't care about what database you use. It just means there is no third party application that's authenticating you, but you're only uh, authenticating over, over the um, local strategy. And then we have the session, of course. Require express session. Actually, I think I, I should be installing these as well um, because I had deleted them, I guess. Um, all right, so the next part is a little bit convoluted. So you can just follow me um, and I'm just, you know, copying what I see here because it's almost impossible to keep these in mind. First, about setting these up, you have to look into the readmes of all the libraries to learn how you, um, how you can make use of them. Um, <coughs> but the thing is, we make use of the, um, the, the session that um, Express created for us. What this does is this saves the user session in the cookie as a session ID and reads the cookie, um, the session ID from the cookie and, you know, learns what kind of information there is within the session so that we can um, talk to the, um, the browser. So you need to pass in a certain secret. Uh, this is like a password. So the, the cookies are encrypted. It's not like raw session IDs. We're not sharing real user information in the cookie. It's encrypted and this key has to be kept really secret. Like you shouldn't should be as simple as WTM Berlin. Don't write the name of your application because that's predictable. Um, it should be a random letter, you know, like 32 random letters or something. And <coughs> uh, we use this to make sure we encrypt uh, what the user sees. And there are unfortunately two additional parameters that you have to pass in in this version, uh, which make no sense at all. Um, like they could definitely use um, defaults, but they require you to pass in resave and save uninitialized um, to, to this thing. 
So what did we use the use method for? Hmm? For all requests, um, it gives us the middleware, right? So whatever you pass in is actually a middleware. So this is the session middleware. This takes the request object and makes sure that you know, if there's a user session, you have the user session information in the request. Um, so the one above, bodyparser.json, makes use of, um, that's also another uh, middleware that takes in the, the body, looks at the request type, and if it's JSON, it parses it into an object so that you can use rec.body. If you remember the last year, uh, the first time I tried to log the JSON, the incoming JSON, I didn't have this as a mistake, and we just saw text, and right after that I went on and wrote this line, bodyparser.json, and then we were able to do console log rec.body. Before that, we didn't have rec.body uh, because we didn't make use of the, the body parser. Okay. <coughs> um, so there are, so we didn't make use of passport yet. Passport is an additional middleware here that comes, and um, the syntax is again something you don't know, but look at the documentation and find out how to use. It's app.use passport.initialize. Apparently, passport.initialize returns um, a middleware so that um, you can make use of passport sessions. So, sorry, um, you can make use of passport functionality and the next one is passport.session. Because a user session could be implemented in anything, passport is just but one library which implements user sessions. So we have the addition of passport session on top of the regular sessions, uh, welcome on top of the regular <coughs> sessions of uh, our applications. All right, um, this is enough code that we wrote here. Um, now we're gonna proceed with creating. For that, I will go back to the, the model section, the models that we have. We currently have a person model. You can create persons in our database, right? But we don't have users, we don't have accounts. So I'm gonna create an account model so that I can store login information. You know, I can register users, their username and passwords. Um, I will call it user model, all right? In the model directory, um, I have something called user model. And it's very simple. We can actually copy stuff over from the person model, like if you look at it, um, sorry, yeah. Practice to write the name of the model as person model because it's already in the models folder. Um, like you mean the suffix dash model? Yes. Um, yeah, because we could have person router, and when I search for person, I actually would like to see um, which file I'm talking to. Um, so it's kind of a not a best practice, but a convention. Uh, people write the like what that person file is doing. Is, is the model, is the service, or is it a route handler? And there's a mistake there. So this could be person router, for example, or should be person router if we wanted to keep um, consistency. Um, any other questions so far? Okay, so the user model. I start with requiring mongoose. Because Mongoose is our ODM, object data mapper, which is something like an object relational uh, mapper, which gives you, you know, objects over the database records and you can create and read stuff. Um, so const user, let me, hope we can actually um, take example of it. Um, user schema equals mongoose.schema. And normally here, I would need to write the fields that I would want in a user um, account, like the username, the password, and whatever, right? I won't do that because I'm using a library for it. The library will, will do that for me. I don't need to repeat myself. 
um, I can actually have an empty schema and the library will make sure that it's it has usernames and passwords and all the functionality so I don't need to pass in any fields but I'm passing in a second um, parameter called strict and I do strict false okay which means um, I can pass in any value because I'm going to implement Twitter login all right Twitter has a profile on its own like when you log in with Twitter Twitter gives you the username their tweets their profile their uh, their birthday all the information that Twitter stored about you um, and I want to keep them which means I don't know which fields I'm expecting because I'm I'm going to get different fields from Facebook for example I'm going to keep all of them um, so I make my models non-strict strict false so that I can keep um, any number of fields in my database records. Um, okay, I now include the passport. So let's close these guys. Passport local um, mongoose, the library that I required. Is, yeah. Is the reason you're not using auto increment because um, it's getting all this information is getting filled in? Yeah. Um, I could definitely use auto increment here as I did in the person model, but I don't need it um, because um, I expect the username to be unique anyway. <coughs> I had some unique identifier there, one, two, three, four. I don't need it here. Like the person ID um, that we created had to be unique. That's why we implemented the, the auto incrementer. Uh, yes. uh, we don't need an ID there. Um, all right, so how do I make use of this passport local mongoose is I do user schema plugin passport local mongoose. So of course all the software that we write they support plugins, right? So that you can extend their functionality beyond what they already give you. And this extends to MongoDB and mongoose as well. In your schemas you can make use of multiple uh, plugins and plugins really ease your life. Now, by just using this line, line six, we have automatic registration, user registration. By just calling a function, we can register users, which encrypts the passwords and stores. We have login, um, we have is logged in, and we have several other methods um, that we can make use of under the user, and we don't have to write them. So this is, this is just perfect. Um, and the last line is just we export the module. Um, mongoose.model user and we say user schema <coughs> okay yeah please is there a reason why you would type the first character of user schema capital um, yes because this is a class so we're defining a class actually it's not an instance and classes um, again by convention have capital um, letters. Um, all right, so I'll go back to app.js. All right. Um, now this thing, it most I didn't make use of the um, the user strategy, um, like our local mongoose strategy. I required it here, right? I said local storage strategy require but I didn't make use of it. So the way I make use of it is I add passport.use because as you can imagine, passport is also extendable with plugins and middleware. Passport.use, um, you normally do new local strategy, okay? Um, and you write a bunch of configuration. You give your database um, address and your model name, whatever. Um, but we're again, we're making use of a library that does it for us. All right. So what we'll type is user dot um, create strategy. This is using the factory pattern. User. I don't care about the actual strategy that's created. I don't care about its um, specific properties. I just tell the user model, hey just create a strategy for me that I can use with Passport and it does it automatically for me. Um, so it's, it's really handy. 
<coughs> of course I have to include the user model here. Yes, yeah, it creates a strategy for local mongoose. Um, perfect, I guess I have most of the stuff. Um, <laughs> there is one more thing that I need to write here. Uh, I need another body parser because we were using JSON, but the next stuff that I'm going to use, it doesn't make use of JSON anymore. Uh, it uses something called um, form data. So form data that you can pass in a URL that we make use of in login pages. Um, and what, what I do is um, I use app.use body parser dot URL encoded and pass in something called extended false. Again, this is all written up in a readme for you um, when you normally manually implement these. So you don't have to memorize these things, like they're just examples that you can pull in. All right, we now have a user, user model and a database record schema that we can put in um, user records. How do we do that? How do we create user accounts? We don't right now. <laughs> so, we need separate roots for that. I'm going to go to the roots folder, um, auth.js, which will help me um, implement login and, um, and registration functionality. I start by um, requiring express. Okay. And it's the same thing we did in the other router. We get the express router. <coughs> if you look at it, this is also a factory. Uh, I'm not calling new here. I say express.router and it gives me a new or an old router that it created before. It actually gives me an old router um, that it created before. And I want to have a registration functionality. Okay. It will be a post request. The URL is register. And I have the usual request, response, and next. I told you that the plugin already gave us registration capabilities, right? So I'm actually fired the model, user model. And now there is a register method here already, and the IDE already knows it. There is a password local model extension and I can register my users with this simple call here. It expects um, a user as the first parameter, it's an object, uh, a password as a string, and a callback. Okay, so it's actually pretty simple. Um, I'm, I will pass in a very simple object. I will pass in the username that I get from the body rec for the username. So when you make a post request to the register URL, it a username and a password when you sign up, for example. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the username, pass it to the register method so that I can sign up, uh, so that I can create a user account on my backend. Um, the second parameter it was expecting was the password in string. So it's rec by the password. I imagine that I will receive the username and password as two, as two fields in the body, in the Axios call. <coughs> and the third parameter is the callback. So it has an error and um, um, basically an account. But I don't need to do anything with that. I'll just say press send. Okay, or to be more fun, maybe let's send the account to the user. Never do this in, in uh, real life. The created account um, to the user because it includes secrets, of course. So let's try this. I don't know if this is going to work, uh, but let's try if we can register ourselves to the system.
Okay. First of all, is it running? Okay, that's a good sign. The server up. Um, let's go to any page that includes Axios. Axios post of that register username test password test. If I do this, I spotted the first bug. Will this work? Raise your hands and tell me if this will work when I type this. Yeah? Yeah, the URL is not correct. But the reason that it's not correct is. No, you removed that. Um, but the reason that's not correct is we created this root handler, but we didn't assign it or make use of it anywhere. So we have the slash auth in the beginning, right? Right as a pref as a prefix. Um, but I never defined that prefix. So if you remember, this is how we define the prefix for person. So in app.js, I should actually make use of something like this. App use slash auth and it should go to the auth router. Um, how do I get the auth router? Um, let's see where the person router is. Oh, it's here. So I just copy this line. Um, right, auth and require routes slash auth. So I make use of this thing. Now this has a slight chance of working, okay? Uh, <laughs> but at least this is a very low hanging fruit and we fixed that bug. Um, I required the auth router and I made sure that I'm using it as a router for every URL that starts with slash auth. Okay? Um, now let's see if this thing will work. I seriously have no idea. Are you done? I'm moving on. Um, you're not done, but we're running out of time. So. Okay, this crashed. Router use requires a middleware function, but um, got an object because we didn't export it. Module exports router. I go back to auth.js, I export the router. And this is working again. So let's run this. Whoa, it worked. So we could create accounts. Amazing. So as you see, um, I was returning the the account that I created so it has a hash a very long random text and a salt again a very long random text if you want to search for look for how these things work you can definitely do it um, how passwords can be kept secret but at this point in time I lost the password I don't know what the password is anymore I can like I know the exact mechanism, the exact equation to calculate the same hash. So given any text, I can calculate the hash. And it will be only equal to this hash if the password that I enter is test again. So I entered test as the password here. If I enter anything else, the hash will be different. So I will know that the password is wrong. If the user enters, I can um, actually calculate this hash again. Question? Yeah. Here. Yeah. So that doesn't mean that we can't reverse engineer the password? Exactly. We can't. Unless we have access to the database and the source code. Because the actual um, function equation that we use is defined in the source code. Um, and you need the salt from the database to be able to calculate that hash. So that hash is actually based on the, the password, the actual password, plus that randomly generated salt, and that salt is different for every record. So you need this raw record plus the source code, or at least you need to know the mechanism, the, uh, the equation that created that hash. Um, and I don't even know what this library uses. I have to look at the source code for it. It's also why it's important to use a custom hashing function, because, I mean, there are you know, maybe a hundred fold hash functions. So as a hacker, I could go through all of them. If I have the salt and I'm very dedicated, I could go through all of them and find the hash function that you used and crack the password. 
Um, so in order to protect yourself from it, you have to use another <coughs> custom function. So unless they can get your source code, they can't um, decipher the actual password. But can they get the salt without getting the source code? Yeah, if they have access to your database through a network, and if they can read records out of your database, the salt is uh, saved in the database. That's why you shouldn't also return the created account object to the user. The user also shouldn't know these. This is basically very, very sensitive data. You can only return the username and stuff and the email to the user, but not the hash and not the salt or the password. And again, we don't keep the password here. This is like nobody can crack this unless they know these values. Um, question? No? One? Why do we put console.com? Sorry? Um, the catch is to catch any exceptions, if there are any errors, so that I can log it to the console as well. And console log is to just to give you this. Otherwise, it won't print anything to the screen. Um, okay. So I didn't have to write any logic at all. I just made use of one single line, and it gave me this uh, registration. And it was the user schema plugin passport local mongoose. Okay, I can create user records. Now, let's see how I can um, log in. Okay, um, we are officially out of time, it's 9.30, um, but normally previously we went until 10. So I'm gonna continue like for 20 minutes um, until they kick us out. Um, if you want to see how the login is built in, just watch me. Um, there was a question. So, should um, I Here? No, this is the end result. I create the account, you're done. You're, because you were meant to sign up. Um, if there were a middleware here, they could call next. What? Ah, okay. No, no, you can't. I can't? <laughs> no, but I will bring it tomorrow to you. Okay, then I have to do it. <laughs> okay, so logging in and how it actually works. So logging in is a little bit more convoluted and um, it's therefore built by Passport. Passport has a mechanism to log you in. Again, I don't have to build stuff for that. Um, login is another post request, okay? to, let's say, local. So if you make a post request to auth slash local, um, we want to log you in. And the way I do it is by using another middleware, this time from Passport. Passport um, dot authenticate. Let me include Passport here. Passport.authenticate and the first one is the name of the strategy. So I need to use the local strategy uh, because that's what I built. Or if you implemented Twitter, you could do Twitter here or Facebook here or anything that you want. Local strategy. Um, now, actually, this is enough. This is enough to log you in, but um, I want to give it some options and the first one is the success redirect why because i want to redirect the user after they log in right i want to redirect them to a new web page um, and tell them that they are logged in and the second one is the failure redirect why because if they can't log in um, i want to redirect them to another page again for them to log in again <coughs> And the, the URL is auth slash login, okay? Which should give us a web page um, to be able to display um, a login form. So, the idea is web page as a pub template, as you saw the JSONs, the, um, the, the list 
pages, but it will give me a form, a login form, where I can enter my username and password and I can click login and I will be logged in, okay? So, how do I build that? I go to the views folder and I create a new pug file, login.pug, and um, basically I will have a form here. The first thing I do is I extend the layout as every other um, pug file. <coughs> Again, you will remember this from last year. The newcomers, you should have watched the sections, the, the lecture, uh, lectures. And we have a content log. I have a form, okay? The URL is out slash local because this will where um, this is where it will post the username and the password to, to log in. And the method is method of the form is post. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, let's have a username label and input called username. Whatever you type here will be the username in the body. Um, another label called password. Okay. This could be text, but of course I want to um, block it with stars. So I do input type password and the button input type submit. login. Um, so this is all it needs to create a new login form. And again, I'm moving forward a little bit. I will go to old slash login and here is the form already. Username, password and the login button. Okay. Um, so it will be test, test, um, but currently it won't work because I forgot to do something. Um, huh? No, um, it's actually a very different, very, very subtle thing. Um, you remember that I was talking about sessions, right? And I said that there's, a, there's something called a session ID. How do you get the user information from the session ID? There has to be a mechanism for the backend All user account from the database and put it in the session. All we have is the session ID. We don't even know who it belongs to. We have to get that user, right? This is called deserialization. Deserialization is the act of getting the user data out of the database given a session ID. Then what is serialization? Serialization is basically making sure that there is a user ID that defines the user in the database. So when you serialize the user, you have a user object already at hand and you define, oh, this is the ID. This is how I serialize my user. And when you deserialize it, you are given that the same ID and you have to find the record from the database and fill the backend with that actual user implementation. Um, despite all of these um, words, it's actually pretty simple. Um, we just and here <coughs> I type passport serialize user okay and again the other uh, the user model the plugin that I used there gives me the serialization capability I do passport dot deserialize user and I do user .deserialize user. So what I did was I bridged two different libraries. Passport was a different library. Um, the plugin that I use for the user model is a different library. Local uh, Passport local mongoose. What I did was I bridged them together. This is kind of called the bridge pattern, the bridge design pattern. And you can read more about that. Um, I brought them together. I said, hey, Passport, if you want to serialize the user, make sure um, that you can function of the user model, okay?
Kind of. Does it kind of make sense? Yeah. So here you're not saying serialize it and then deserialize it. You're just saying if you want to serialize it, do this. And yes. If you want to deserialize it, do that. Okay. Exactly. And if you remember, the order of the middleware are important. And I guess I should put this serialization logic first. Um, because when I call passport session or passport initialize, it already knows how to deserialize the user. Right? If you remember the order of the, um, of the middleware, it's important where you put them. So this thing is still running. That's good. Let's see if we will be able to log in. Yay! Okay, we logged in. Um, perfect. Now, the final thing, and we're actually uh, right on time, actually. The final thing is, I want to prove you that we display the username here in this, um, in this file. So, hello, I should display the username. Um, I go to, so this is the home page? Yeah, this is the home page because I redirected um, to the home page after the success. Okay, so it's basically here, index.pug, hello, did I update? Um, I want to have a, a, a variable called username here. Hello, blah, blah, did I update? And how I affect this is I go to the um, app.js. This thing is served here, um, get slash. And now we have something called rec.user. So I created a new parameter to this rest render index. This is where you can pass in parameters. And I will say username equals rec dot user dot username. Does it make sense? Let's see then. Oh, when I refresh, I get cannot read property username of undefined. Why can that be the case? No, because I'm not logged in. I restarted the application and the sessions are gone. The sessions are currently kept in memory. So whenever you restart the application, the sessions are gone, which means you need to log in again. Oh, um, login, test, test. Yeah, see, you now see the username. And whenever you refresh it, you will get this username. So because the, the session is still in the memory. Okay, one last thing. Let's make sure the error doesn't happen again. Like um, whenever there's no session, let me restart the application. That means I'm not logged in anymore. I see this error, right? I don't want to show the screen to people who are not authenticated, who are not logged into the system. Okay, um, I want to hide this page. I do that by doing what? Huh? Creating a middleware. Yes, exactly. Um, so we had this ensure login middleware here, right? Yes. If there are no users, if rec.user is empty, you can <coughs> do res uh, dot redirect out login. I redirect directly to the login. If there are any users, then I move on. Okay? Is it simple? All right. Um, now there is a bit, and it's called is authenticated. That's a method that you can use that comes with passport that works with all the strategies. If the request is authenticated, um, sorry, if the request is not authenticated, go to login. If the request is authenticated, just go on, call next. Make sense? Yeah. Um, now let's use this in our app.js. It will be here, ensure login. Yeah. Okay, I save it. I try to go to the home page. It redirected me to the login page. Um, I try to log in 
with the test account, it shows me the, the home page. So it worked. I'm now authenticated. I'm now logged in, right? What I can do is I can go to the console and remove the cookie. See, this is, um, this is the value of the cookie. It's a very, very long text, random looking letters. Um, this is not the session ID, this is the whole cookie. Um, no, sorry, this is the session ID, but it includes more than the actual session ID and the actual username. Um, but you shouldn't lose this. If you lose this, like this, first, you're logged out. Okay? And if I give this to any one of you, and if you double click and edit this, like if I paste this on with you, everybody will share my session. Everybody will be able to imitate me. So uh, that's why this is really um, important to keep secret and browsers do a good job at keeping it a secret so that third party applications cannot access those. Um, except the extensions that you allow all access to all data on your websites, like ad blockers. They can read your cookies. That's why you shouldn't trust ad blockers. They are selling your data. <clears throat> Can you log in with the uh, test, but with the wrong password? Yeah, let's do that. So, first let's remove the um, session and test three something else. Um, it redirects me back to the login screen because we had that here as the, um, as the failure redirect here. Um, to do this like this let's see if it will redirect to Facebook or google.com yeah when I cannot type the password correctly it redirects to Google so you should have you know a, a, another page that says hey sorry um, you typed the wrong password and stuff yeah yeah something about uh, can we uh, say again what is uh, serializing the, the user so serializing the user takes the username. Takes the username. So it's before. So it's, this happens uh, when the user submits uh, his uh, his uh, his form. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So uh, what happened? And deserializing the user, um, we put the username in a hashed encrypted way into the session, and the session ID is in the cookie. The cookie gives me the session ID. I go to my memory, find the user ID, and then I. That's how we had rec.user. Rec.user is the deserialized version of the user with the user ID in the session. Okay, so uh, in, every, in, every, in every attempt, uh, attempt where we serialize the user and we use this uh, serialized user uh, to compare it? We serialize the user only when you're creating the session. Only when we're the Yeah. And we deserialize it every time you make a request. Because every time you make a request, we only know the session ID. From the session ID, we get the user ID. From the user ID, we get the actual user by deserializing it. Um, OK. We are definitely over time. I'll take the questions afterwards. Um, but I recorded this. And this is the extent that I wanted to show you today, actually. Um, and the homework is, for two weeks in time, is to implement another login strategy. So whether it's Twitter, whether it's Facebook, GitHub, Google, um, implement another login strategy within your app. And we can talk about this um, on Slack as well. I'll be more than happy to help you. Thank you for listening to me today.